The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. We're all in this together. Chin up, tomorrow's another day. Kind words, very positive sounding, people mean well, but might they also be somewhat toxic? We'll consider that. Then, a most remarkable life story of turning things around. Former Ontario New Democrat MPP Sherry DeNovo is with us on her quite stunning memoir. It's Tuesday, May the 18th, and that's next on The Agenda. When something really crummy happens, a job loss, a health scare, or maybe even a pandemic, people often jump to offer words of encouragement and suggest ways to look on the bright side. They mean well, but for those living through the bad news, such positivity can feel downright toxic. With us to explain, in Boulder, Colorado, Dr. June Gruber, an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Colorado and director of the Positive Emotion and Psychopathology Laboratory there. In our nation's capital, Dr. Peter Leo, a registered clinical psychologist at Hunt Club Psychological Services, that's a private family practice, and in Oakville, Ontario, Sidney Loney, a writer and editor who recently wrote about toxic positivity for Chatelaine magazine. And we're delighted to welcome the three of you to TVO tonight. Uh, June Gruber, get us started here. Everybody, I think, is familiar with the concept of toxic negativity, maybe not toxic positivity. What's that? <laughs> When we think of toxic positivity, really what we're thinking about is the pressure to experience positive feelings or the experience of happiness itself in contexts that really don't align with that. So these can be stressful contexts, contexts of loss. And in those contexts, really pushing people to feel positive or forcing positive feelings may actually backfire and harm our own psychological health and well-being. Peter, can you pick up on that? What's so bad about toxic positivity? Well, the problem with it um, is when people go too far and they ignore or dismiss negative emotions. Um, so some people may try to keep things upbeat and happy, but um, over time, um, people just feel alienated and um, maybe um, not understood and shut down. Sydney, this is, of course, the exact opposite effect that people who do this want to have. Uh, so, um, I mean, does intention not count for anything these days? That's a good question. I, I mean, it comes from a good place, but I think that it ends up pe leaving people feeling as though they're not being acknowledged, that their their feelings are being minimized, and I think that can be very difficult for people. Okay. June, you want to give us an example of when this kind of thing might take place? Certainly. So we found that when people experience emotions, that instead of experiencing a diversity of positive and negative feelings, particularly in times of loss, that people may try to either suppress those emotions or even replace them with positive feelings. Imagine you have a sick a relative or friend in the hospital, or you've just lost your job, you're grieving with systemic racism, and experiencing joy and exuberance would be inappropriate, and the pressure to feel it may lead us actually to feel worse, and maybe even at greater risk for depression and other mood difficulties. Well, let's do a real-life example about this. Sydney, you wrote about this in Chatelaine magazine, and, and you, you, you can draw on personal experience uh, for this topic that we're talking about tonight. Give us the example, if you would. Yeah, that's true. I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in the middle of, of a pandemic, which is not, not amazing. Um, but I spent a lot of my time trying to reassure everybody around me and myself that everything was fine, that I wasn't worried, that I wasn't upset so that they wouldn't feel worried or upset either. And it, it ended up sort of, it was exhausting to sort of keep up that facade all the time. And in the end, it, it you know, it always sort of backfires when it finally all sort of comes to a head and you just can't do it anymore. But it, it it's sort of a default defense mechanism, I think. And you're trying to protect yourself as much as you're trying to protect those around you from, from negative emotions or so-called negative emotions. What kinds of things did people say to you at the time? At the time, um, it, it was a lot of, at least it was caught early. And um, of course, my, my, my mastectomy was delayed because of the pandemic. And, and, and especially I noticed the toxic positivity afterwards before I even knew what it was. Um, I didn't know there was a name for it. I just sort of, certainly afterwards when I started doing some research, it, it all made sense to me, but there was a lot of those comments 
like, you know, at, at least, you know, this is terrible, but at least the worst is over now. And it's sort of a, at least, I think those, that those two words together that sort of does the minimizes the, the experience and the fallout from that. That's the sort of the most difficult. And then, and I, when I started doing some research, I realized I was just as, as guilty of that as, as everybody, because you, you know, what do you say? You're, you're trying to avoid those uncomfortable conversations. You're trying to make the other person um, feel better. And, and that's sort of what we reach to. It's sort of this ingrained response. Let me do one more quick follow-up with you, and that is, it, rather than people saying, well, at least they caught it early, or, you know, at least you're young and you've got a shot to fight back, what should they have said? I think, in doing my research for the piece, I, I think I actually drew a lot from the psychologists I spoke to, because the one thing that resonated for me was just sort of letting the person, acknowledging that it was okay not to feel okay and acknowledging that they might have other things, might be feeling differently and just letting them talk. So just sort of just asking, you know, how are you, um, how are you doing now? And keeping all of the other sort of comments out of the mix. June, can you build on that? What would, what would be the better thing to say to somebody suffering from a potentially life-threatening situation? I think the point that would be really appropriate is to normalize negative emotions, that it's completely appropriate and acceptable to feel sad, to feel anxious, to feel frustrated, that these are emotions that are giving us signals about what's going on in our life and to allow the person to feel those emotions and to process the real stressor in front of them. That's interesting. So, Peter, the actual pursuit of happiness which is basically what these comments are intended to do, right? This can be problematic at the end of the day, fair to say? Uh, for sure, because I think, you know, when you are living in a culture that is uh, always um, pushing you to better yourself and improve yourself, and, you know, when you work hard, you can achieve great success, you know, there can be a real um, strong uh, feeling that, you have to keep it positive. You have to keep it upbeat. You have to like be strong all the time. And unfortunately, this can really be a problem because uh, the pursuit of happiness, when it's too far, it can have a dark side where those standards and expectations of yourself could be not realistic and, um, and uh, it can actually harm you greatly over time because of this, um, this need to um, kind of keep it positive. It consumes a lot of energy. Hmm. June, can I get you as well on that notion, the obligation of the pursuit of happiness and the consequences thereof? Absolutely. We've done some research in my lab in collaboration with Brett Ford, who's at the University of Toronto, and Iris Mouse at UC Berkeley, finding that the more people endorse um, wanting to be happy, or what we call the obsession with the pursuit of happiness, it's, it paradoxically backfires. By that, I mean people end up feeling less happy in positive situations, being with friends, watching positive movies. And in fact, we find the more obsessed people are with pursuing happiness in and of itself can actually lead to greater risk for depression and symptoms of bipolar disorder as well. Peter, do people know this? You know, I think most people really don't really um, know this consciously. They're, they're not really aware of what they're doing because um, these, um, these feelings um, can be internalized and um, maybe people can have these um, well-meaning um, beliefs that this is the right way, this is the healthy way. And so um, even though they're being very toxic, they don't realize it at all. Well, Sydney, you know, that, that does raise the question then. If, if we know that it's actually not the right thing to do, why do we do it? It's, it that's such a good question. It's, it's so hard not to do it. I think hmm. that you know, you have all of those. The reason that there are these cliche, cliches exist, like the whole, you know, keep a stiff upper lip and um, always look on the bright side. And you know, coming from a British background, you know, you, the whole stiff upper lip thing was deeply ingrained in in my psychology. So it, it was always, you have to be strong, you have to be positive, um, and also that idea that just no one wants to be around someone who's negative all the time. And you, you, I didn't want to feel like people think, would think that I was complaining because, you know, no matter how bad it was, there's always someone who has it worse. So there's also that I, we're always constantly thinking about how we're being um, perceived by others. And I think that is also part of it. I should ask you, how are you now anyway? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Glad to hear. Peter, put us into a common scenario where, uh, let's say a typical married couple, one of them is a very sort of normally chipper, upbeat person. The other person is, you know, just kind of walks around with a cloud over their head all the time. Um, 
You want to give some advice on how to handle that situation? Yeah, yeah. In that kind of case where one person is more um, toxically positive um, and not listening to the other partner, that person who is more upset may be feeling invalidated and dismissed whenever communicating about negative things. So if that pattern continues, uh, that person would feel more unheard and discouraged and may share less and less of those experiences over time. So um, the problem is that this can build up slowly over time in a relationship and lead to emotional detachment and uh, um, serious conflict. So um, when um, people are uh, noticing this happening, I think it's really important to improve the emotional communication, um, uh, try to um, recognize when this is happening and try to listen better and um, really get to into the other person's experience rather than trying to replace it with your own. That's the key, eh, June? Listen more, talk less? Absolutely. And to kind of follow up on that point, we found that people who have what we call high levels of, of dispositional positive emotion, people that tend to experience positivity across context, this may actually cause them trouble in relationships where a partner's sharing something negative with you. Imagine your partner has come home from work and had a stressful day or received some bad news about their health. We find that those who continue to have these high levels of positive emotion in those relationship contexts end up misunderstanding their partner. And that can pose obvious um, concerns for relationship satisfaction and the ability to really connect with others and support them. Hmm. Sydney, you researched this for your piece, obviously, for Chatelaine. How far back does this, what do you want to call it, positivity trap, how far back into history does this actually go? Uh, it, it's funny. It's, it's not a new phenomenon, that's for sure. I'm in one of my um, sources that I interviewed sort of compared to what we're what we do now on Instagram to, you know, back in 18th century portraits. If you're walking through an art gallery, you can see, you know, a, a, a man with a, his dog and his kids and his wife and everybody's um, beautifully dressed. And, you know, as I noted in my article, you, you don't see, you know, the outdoor plumbing and the smallpox scars. Like there's this whole idea of creating this fake persona, this this artifice of, of positivity and affluence and happiness. Um, if you go through any Instagram feed, you won't see people... Um, most of the time where it's very, it's very um, curated and it's a whole sort of, there's a lot of artifice in this world that we create online for others to see. And I think that we do that ourselves as well. And it, it goes back for, you know, forever. Hmm. I don't necessarily uh, want you to throw any of your family or relatives under the bus here, <laughs> but I am going to ask this question anyway. I mean, you mentioned a few moments ago, you got this sort of British stiff upper lip thing going on in your family. Um, did you have it out with any of your family members when you were going through what you were going through? Um, I I just was being. I mean, remember my mom always saying to me, "You're you're always so positive. You're always so um, upbeat about everything." And and I even even felt uh, hesitant to tell my my mom, who I'm very close to, how I was feeling. And she's always been very strong growing up. I you know even when, I didn't never knew when times were bad, even when they were bad, because she she hid everything. And so I think that has sort of, um, I've inherited that. And I never really had it out with anybody. I just just found myself doing the same thing with my with my kids and my family. Hmm. It's just occurred to me, we should have invited your mom to come on the show too and get her <laughs> side of the story, just in case the daughter isn't- She would have isn't... killed me. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> <laughs> let's not have any of that. Uh, okay, June, pick up the story from this angle. Social media, of course, has a profound impact on everything today, usually negative. I shouldn't say that, but it's, it feels like it's so much of the time. What has social media done to the st uh, topic we're discussing tonight? I mean, I think social media is complex, right? Because as you said, there's a duality to it. There are ways that it, especially in times of physical separation, can give us some sense of being connected to others. But I think the dark side or downside of it when it comes to positivity is creating unrealistic standards for how we ought or should be feeling right now. Um, people are posting images of smiling with their friends or their family or going out and doing fun things, winning awards, humble bragging, all these sorts of things. And it creates what we call a kind of discord because we're engaging in social comparison and those social media images are setting up standards for how we think we should be feeling and that's not always positive it it does peter though put people in a difficult spot you know if they've got a birthday or an anniversary or their kid does something well and they do want to boast slash share the news with other people 
I don't know. Is there a way to do that that doesn't uh, overdo what we're talking about here? Well, I think if you're really careful to speak to your own experience and your personal experience, um, and you're not really um, kind of um, trying to um, make a, a larger statement, um, everyone's entitled to uh, share what, what they're really going through. And some of that is positive. So naturally, I think sharing that is fine. Um, but I, I think if you're sharing that all the time, if you're, you're feeling a compulsion to present this false facade in your um, in your relationships um, with other people online, um, that can uh, lead to a, a very toxic um, pattern. I should ask, Sydney, the, the experience you went through with cancer, how much of that did you share on social media and what kind of feedback did you get to it and was it ultimately helpful or not to you? Uh, I'm not, I actually hadn't told a lot of friends and family. I'm not a, it wasn't something I wanted to talk about when I was, when I got my diagnosis. So I ended up, I did end up writing a piece about it when the um, surgery was canceled, just because I felt it was something that people needed to know about. Because at that time, this was early on in the pandemic, we didn't know about elective surgeries being canceled. And that was how a lot of my friends and family found out, which kind of ripped the bandaid off on that one. Um, after that, I, I didn't share, I didn't post on social media about it. Um, I posted one short post when I got back from the hospital and that was it, just sort of to let some of my immediate friends, people who, I had so many well-wishers, so I wanted to sort of let them know without making a big deal out of it, but that, that was it. Hmm. Well, and the response was wonderful. Uh, people were lovely. Oh, good. Uh, we, um, we've mentioned this article that you wrote for Chatelaine a number of times right now, so why don't we go back to February 9th, 2021. Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring the graphic up and I'll read along. Here's an excerpt from that piece. The term po toxic positivity isn't bandied about much in academic circles, but there are other names for it, like unrealistic optimism. It isn't just an individual problem. As a society, we collectively like to pretend things are fine, which can invalidate the severity and complexity of serious situations. There's plenty of invalidating going on amid the pandemic. The we're all in this together mantra that surfaced early on during the global crisis is both misleading and harmful. Okay, Sydney, pick up the story there, because I, I know there, there, it, I think there got to be a moment in this pandemic when, you know, people said, you know, we're all in this together. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to smack somebody type of thing. Did that get to you as well? It, it did. And it's funny, I still, I drove down the road the other day and I still saw people on billboards and companies are still posting those kinds of, 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 of messages and, and platitudes. And I think it's dangerous because we're, we're, no, we're not all in this together. We're not all in the same situation. There are so many people who, you know, like I said in my article, if you've lost your job, it's not like you suddenly have this wonderful newfound leisure time to perfect your sourdough starter. It, <laughs> it started to feel as though, you know, it was really glossing the surface and putting everybody in the same um, sort of boat, same situation when it's so not the case. And there's so much disparity in terms of how the pandemic has affected people. And I think that's where it really sort of uh, went awry. Hmm. June, what do you see in particular during this pandemic in terms of toxic positivity? I think I see the failure to embrace a diversity of emotions, acknowledging that everyone may be feeling different things. And in particular, glossing over those people who at times may be experiencing profound levels of disruption, of stress, of anxiety, and of hopelessness. Um, it may be glossing over the global mental health crisis that we're facing right now. Peter, how about you on that same question? Um, I would say that um, what I'm seeing in my practice is that a lot of people are experiencing more stress than ever because um, the pandemic has uh, forced people into close quarters, living together, spending more time together, and this heightens areas of tension and conflict. So um, also people are being oversaturated with bad news. And, um, you know, some this is really hard to cope with, and some people just overcompensate with positivity. Hmm. I wonder, Peter, if... If there's an issue about not nipping this in the bud, you know, the next generation down tends to model the behavior of the previous generation. So w will this just go on and on and on until we recognize and do something about it? Well, it, it, it could, in fact, and that's um, what I'm worried about. But um, I believe that, well, all people can change and grow. And uh, I think the best way that people can um, kind of grow out of this pattern and shift uh, their thinking is by uh, listening better and validating people's emotional experiences and being able to uh, talk about and listen to the full range of human emotion. Um, all that richness um, 
and connection helps people actually to, to cope better with adversity. So mm -hmm. I think um, there's a way through this. Sydney, there's an expression you use. You call yourself yourself a reformed positivity pusher. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I, I mean that I I was very um, one of those people who would do all of the things I I've, we've been talking about today. And when trying to make people feel better, I would use all the, the same platitudes and try to be, um, you know, yes, this happened, but hey, look at this. And um, I think now that I'm much more aware of, of not doing that, I'm, I'm, and I think that's important for, for, for people to, to consider is just to, that self-awareness that um, that isn't always the best, best answer to somebody or the best response to a difficult situation. June, how hard a habit is this to break? I think it's not as hard to break as we think it might be. And in fact, the more we educate ourselves and others that what's healthiest for our minds, our emotional ecosystem, you could call it, is diversity. And that emotions aren't things to be pushed away or to try to promote in an unhealthy manner, but simply information about our world, um, that that might change the lens through which we think about what emotions are and why we have them in the first place. Hmm. Um, let me follow up with you on this, June, because mm -hmm. I, I know as people are watching or listening to this right now, they're probably saying to themselves, how do I navigate this very tough tightrope of not wanting to be overly positive, but on the other hand, you know, if somebody was facing a fatal illness, you wouldn't want to say to them in order to avoid being toxically positive, well, I guess your chances aren't going to be too good on this, are they? So where, where do you find the sweet spot? I think you're right that finding that emotional balance is challenging, but I think we got to take it one step at a time and really one moment at a time. And as we're living through this pandemic, in those challenging moments, as you mentioned, a friend going through a really challenging time, to be able to acknowledge this duality that you can feel both positive and negative at the same time, and that your feelings may change one day to the next, um, and that our emotions are complex, and that there's no one right emotion at any particular time, but that we need to adapt and embrace all the diverse emotions because we actually know that diverse emotions rather than positive emotions alone are better predictors of our mental and mood health in the long run. I do get that now, but Peter, I wonder if there's a concern about embracing the negative side of emotions too much and you end up being a depressed person yourself, which obviously defeats the purpose of the whole thing. Yes, yeah, certainly um, that can happen. And when you get in a negative cycle, this is further compounded when you are experiencing um, uh, fight or flight. You know, you are literally threatened and you are thinking more about these terrible things and you can be locked in these cycles for a very long time. Um, so I think it's important to uh, remain, remain balanced and um, accept the whole of people's experience, the, the light and the dark, like um, um, was uh, spoken about earlier. So. Um, in a way, um, you can avoid um, um, kind of going to extremes. If you're just listening to yourself and being very aware of what's happening inside you and uh, self-correcting. June, I wonder if, could you give us some advice on this? Is the, is the advice different for somebody who is facing a health challenge versus a job loss versus Look, I've seen some people, you know, when their team loses the night before, they're, they come into work all mopey and depressed the next day. Uh, you know, three levels of unhappiness, obviously of varying degrees. Is the advice the same in each case? I think the th advice that would be consistent across these circumstances is one to accept that you may have negative emotions, right? Rather than criticize yourself or blame yourself, know that that's completely appropriate. And they may be different, of course, levels of negative emotion, depending on how stressful the situation is. But that having negative emotions and accepting them um, does not prevent you from also finding ways to cope and move forward and confront the challenges to the best of your ability. Sydney, we'll give you the last word on this. Advice for those watching right now? I, I think... I like that idea of accepting and acknowledging those emotions. I think that's one thing that I've learned. I Initially, I would do anything but be alone with my thoughts. So I kept myself busy and distracted and, and pretending things were fine. And then in that, um, in the end, it made it very difficult and it was exhausting. So I think do yourself a favor and, um, 
you know, acknowledge those emotions and look at them and and appreciate them and value them as much as the positive ones. Did you come to any conclusions, incidentally, about whether men or women are worse at this? <laughs> oh, actually, no. <laughs> I, I think I think it's fairly even across the board. Good. We like equality. Uh, that's Sydney Loney. You can look for her piece in Chatelaine magazine. Peter Leo is here from the nation's capital. And June Gruber, we thank you for joining us from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Great to have you three on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow on the agenda. Literally pick up any one part of India and you, you see how many fires burn or how many bodies are buried and you compare it to the official data that is released by that particular district or that neighborhood on that day or in that week, you will, you will see a manifold gap. The second thing that is happening uh, is that as I have traveled through rural India, we have seen ghastly images of corpses floating in our rivers. There has been a mass dumping. Uh, we don't know if it's been from the stigma of COVID, which continues to exist in our villages, or whether it's because poor people are literally running short of money to cremate their dead. So you have entire villages saying that we've seen a sudden surge in deaths. People never got to hospital. They, just, they were ill for three days and they died. There is no documentation of COVID on their death certificate. But all of this adds up to a large, large mass of either, you know, deaths that are never reported as COVID or are being undercounted or are just not being registered as anything. They're just abandoned bodies. So I think we may never actually fully know the scale of how many Indians are dying from COVID. That's tomorrow on the agenda. I've been watching events at Queen's Park for almost four decades, and I think it's safe to say that there has never been another member of the Ontario legislature like Sherry DeNovo. She represented Parkdale High Park from 2006 to 2017, but the life she experienced before she got into politics was plain and simply astonishing. She chronicles it all in a new memoir. It's called The Queer Evangelist, a socialist clergy's radically honest tale. And Sherry DeNovo joins us now from Parkdale in the provincial capital. So good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm, I'm fine, Steve. It's wonderful to see you again as well. Well, let's start with that introduction I gave. You've obviously met hundreds of politicians in your time as well. Can you think of anyone who comes remotely close to the background you brought into politics? Uh, well, there probably are. But I think what's unusual about this book, perhaps, is the fact that I told people about it. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're very used to in politics uh, giving one version of ourselves to the public and another to everyone who knows us in private. And I tried not to do that in this book. Well, OK, that's a fair point. But I'm going to just do a little fact checking with you here because I don't think anybody has had this kind of background. For example, when you were a kid, you write that you came home one day to see your mother's lover pick up a knife and slash your aunt across the throat. You saw a man in his bed with his head blown off by a shotgun. Sherry, what kind of childhood did you have exactly? Well, uh, an incredibly traumatic one, obviously. And I think like a number of queer kids before me, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't easy for a number of reasons, and it was the reason why I left home when I was about 15 years old and found the streets a safer place than being in my own house. Uh, and and that is the story of a lot of queer kids even today and a lot of kids that experience trauma. I mean, back then, um, we didn't know the words post-traumatic stress disorder, but now we do. And uh, that's clearly what I was suffering from at the time. Yes, um, on the surface, it was a normal household. And then behind closed doors, it was anything but. Given everything you went through, how is it that you turned out so put together? Well, debatable, I guess, Steve, depending <laughs> on who you speak to. Um, but uh, because I had to, it's a very simple answer. Uh, I mean, again, I think a lot of people who've experienced trauma and gone through it and come out the other side um, have had to do a lot of work, and I've done that work. And, uh, uh, you know, um, we... 
we develop compassion or we do not survive, we develop compassion for ourselves or we do not survive. And that's the simple reality of being a child of a traumatic background. Um, and again, I know that I'm speaking to a lot of people who have survived trauma out there who are listening to this broadcast, so they will know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's an excerpt from the book. Men, I was always taught, were a distraction or a luxury, never essential in our homes. I was also to understand this made us not of this world, the world of bourgeois convention. Their world would always find us strange. The women who were my role models would have lovers, husbands, and sometimes both at the same time. I was raised in a polyandrous household with two dads. Being queer, being sexually different, wasn't so very queer on Bedford Road which for those who live outside Toronto is a spot in downtown Toronto. Tell us about, I mean, you, you do go into detail here about coming home from school every day and having boys yell at you, dyke or lesbo or that kind of thing. I mean, you clearly had an unconventional childhood. Were you depressed and miserable throughout it? Uh, not at all. And, and not you know, unconventional in terms of queer kids. I mean, back then, I didn't even know. I mean, when the boys would chase me home from school, I didn't even know what dyke meant. I just knew that it was something negative. Um, and, you know, really looking back at me as a little girl, um, I kind of just looked like a little girl. You know, I had short hair or long hair or whatever. Um, but it was clearly a pejorative, and I learned uh, what that pejorative meant, of course, much later. But again, I just want to emphasize that my background it sounds stark, but it's not an unusual background for a queer kid. Um, this is what a lot of queer children experience in school, and they experience it before they even understand who they are or what it all means. So um, there were lots of happy times in my childhood, too, and I don't want to uh, dismiss that. Um, but I do want to tell the truth, and I did want to tell the truth in this book because I think the truth sets you free, and I think it also gives hope to children who are going through that right now. Well, is that a picture of you behind you that I'm seeing right now? Because you look kind of happy in that shot. It, it, it is. Um, that's a picture behind me at Toronto's very first Pride event. Um, as you can see, I've aged into blonde. Um, and that was me with my girlfriend back then in 1971. So Toronto's first Happy Pride event, um, that was taken on Hanlon's Point. Um, there's a couple of luminaries behind me. I think James Dubrow was over at one shoulder there, too. Um, but at any rate, uh, uh, that's also the cover of the book. So, yeah. Okay. Sherry, don't take this the wrong way, but y your last name is DeNovo, but you just do not present in a very Italian way. Why is that? Uh, okay, so my, my father was born in Toronto. His family came over the turn of the century from Sicily, and my mother's family came over the, not long after from England. I was raised, actually, in a pretty English household. My dad did not even speak Italian. It Certainly in those days, uh, the idea of moving to Canada was that you lost your language, that you, in a sense, denied your culture, and you tried to fit in with uh, the WASP majority. And and so I was raised really in a, in a, a, a matriarchal family, as I, I said in the book. Uh, my grandmother originally um, owned the house that we lived in on Bedford Road, ran it as a rooming house. And uh, she was from England. She was first generation here. So, um, so it was a kind of uh, an interesting household in that sense. Uh, I do have Italian relatives that that made it an issue to maintain the language or to learn the language. Uh, but that wasn't the general rule back then in Toronto or quite frankly in Canada generally. You kind of, you know, tried to fit in and fitting in meant uh, becoming as wasp as you could. Hmm. Eccellente, signora. Capisco adesso. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <See. laughs> All right. I want to do another excerpt from the book here. And, uh, oh my goodness, this one is stark. You write, I fed myself by selling LSD. At the time, under the Food and Drug Act and not criminalized, that was imported from California in hollowed out Bibles. Yes, I get the irony. That's a great line, Sherry. You are very candid about the, the, drug, the drugs that you used back in the day. You dropped out of school uh, after grade 10. You used to go days without eating or sleeping. You were living in the streets. You were taking drugs. Serious question here. How come you aren't dead? 
Uh, well, many of uh, the folk that I knew back then uh, are dead, sadly, and then there are a few that are really good friends that survived and thrived, um, not a lot. Um, to be a, a queer kid on the streets of Toronto now as then is a dangerous place to be. There's not a lot of things you can do to make a living. Um, that's why most of the folk I knew were involved in the drug trade. And uh, again, you know, how, how do you live? I mean, you sleep rough, you know, if you can, you find a couch. If you can, you all pile into a bachelor apartment somewhere. Uh, if you can, you sleep uh, because the weather's nice uh, outside. And in fact, I used to tell the story at Queen's Park that I uh, was in an office at Queen's Park overlooking where I used to sleep, which was in Queen's Park. Uh, so that <laughs> bit of an unusual background for a member of provincial parliament. And I have to say that I never hid that story of drug use and drug abuse, never. Um, it was used against me in my first uh, run uh, for office. Uh, and that was a sad, uh, sad reality because quite frankly, those in my church who had mental health or addiction issues, they saw surviving the streets as a message of hope. And I hope the people that read this book see it as a message of hope as well. No, I think it backfired against the people who used it because obviously you won. I did, and uh, again and again and again, yes. <laughs> yes, you did. All right, another excerpt from the book here because, um, well, eventually you did a very conventional thing. You got married. You got married to a guy named Don, and yeah. you had two kids with Don, and here's another quote from the book. By that point in my life, you write, I'd been traumatized, addicted, raped, and homeless on the streets, but nothing prepared me for the horrors of parenting a colicky infant. Horrors is not an exaggeration. Really? Uh, yeah, and again, I'm going to speak, uh, you know, this is not a Hallmark card. Uh, this is an experience of motherhood that will ring with many women out there, especially those who suffer from postpartum depression, which again was not a term that was used very much in those days. When you have an infant who is crying, does not sleep, and uh, you go day in, day out like that, that is a kind of torture. And in my particular household, there wasn't a lot of help. We didn't have in-laws around. Uh, my husband, the kid's dad, Don, at the time, his parents were in Chicago, mine were dead. Um, there wasn't help. And uh, I, I have to tell you that, of course, uh, it really shatters what, what any kind of mental health that you have. Um, and particularly because you love of the child, right? And, and so uh, I didn't sleep for months at a time. Um, this is not normal. And now, of course, there's help. There's more help. Uh, but at the time, there wasn't. I was very isolated, felt very alone, and, um, of course, uh, pretty traumatized. Now, of course, I'm kind of exaggerating there. Um, but, I mean, uh, but, you know, if you're living through it, it's not an exaggeration. And again, I hope this gives hope to uh, women who are experiencing that right now. There are few things worse in this world than postpartum depression. There are few things worse than having a child with issues that does not sleep and cries and there's no comfort. Um, so you know who I'm speaking to out there. And again, I hope this book shows that you can survive that. And by the way, she's an adult now. She's wonderful. She's one of my best friends in the world. And that passed. And, and she owes you big time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but I owe her. <laughs> That's nice. Well, Sherry, as if all the things you've been telling us weren't enough, your husband, Don, was killed in a motorcycle accident, and your kids were only 14 and 9 when all that happened. How in heaven's name did you get through all that? Well, again, I'm not alone in surviving uh, the death of a spouse, and uh, and certainly my children are not alone in in surviving the death of a spouse. Um, I, I I really would like to give a shout out to bereaved families of Ontario because. We finally found help with them. It's a wonderful nonprofit organization, and they provide the kind of uh, the kind of counseling that my son uh, really needed and received, and that we really needed. Because while he was getting his counseling, I was in meeting with others like myself who'd lost a spouse. Uh, Don really was my best friend. Uh, he was a wonderful father. And uh, so, of course, um, it was, yes, traumatic. Um, but we're here. Um, we're all survivors, and uh, as so many are. But I, again, um, I hope the book shows folk how to navigate that, because you can.
It definitely does do that, but, but at some point, I presume, you had to have said to yourself, you know, maybe looking upward at the heavens, I mean, God, enough already. I mean, I've been, I, I've been through it. Yes, you, you tell us you've been through things that other people have been through too, but my goodness, what a load you've had, Sherry. Uh, I suppose, yes. I mean, I, I prefer to kind of look at uh, the joy of having two children, the, the incredible honor and privilege of being able to have served at Queen's Park for as long as I did, um, for, for the, you know, the, the, for the bills that I got passed into law that have changed lives. And again, lives of people who were marginalized and are marginalized too. So I have so much to be thankful for and so much to be grateful for. And yes, of course, it also took me into church. It also got me seeking and and you know exploring spirituality because I needed support, and that also is a blessing. And that and that I'm also grateful for. So whatever took me to this to the the points that I reached, and whatever's brought me here, Steve, I uh, you know there, there's nothing but a big thank you in all of that hmm. from me. Okay, uh, since you mentioned politics, let's go there next because. Um, Here's one thing I'm really trying to figure out. You know that when parties go out and look for candidates or when potential candidates come forward and approach parties, uh, you know, the first thing both sides presumably want, or I guess traditionally want, the parties want those potential candidates to be as milk toast in their backgrounds as possible. They want the husband, the wife, the two smiling kids, the dog. You know what they want, the picket fence and the whole thing. And that's not you. So somewhere... I'm trying to figure out how how you and the NDP got together in a way where somebody said, in spite of everything, yes, we think you can be a great MPP and win. Well, partly they probably just didn't do their research very well, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never did anything. And in fact, in my first book, Queering Evangelism, I talk about my background a bit as well. Um, but also... Um, Parties want someone who already has a profile in that community. And quite frankly, that's why the NDP came looking for me, because at that point I'd performed Canada's first legalized same-sex marriage and got quite a bit of publicity. I also was the minister in a church that had grown substantially and that was well known in the area for dealing with people like myself, um, having an evening service uh, of folk that had mental health and addiction issues and where they were welcomed into the pews just as they were. So that gave me a profile in the community, and that's why the NDP came looking for me, because they thought I could win. Very simple. Well, and you did, and you also write some very candid things in this book about your time with the NDP and in politics, and let's start with this. All legislatures, you tell us, run on a mix of fear and self-importance that every word said when we're on our hind legs is of note. Now, I get the self-importance. We run into that all the time when we talk to politicians. But the fearful parts of the job, talk to us about that. Certainly. Uh, well, first of all, there's the constant fear, and you're reminded of this, of uh, will you be reelected? So you're constantly uh, trying to make sure that that you know, that does happen, that you are reelected. Um, and also, of course, uh, when you're standing on your hind legs in the house, it's a pretty public place to be, and what comes out of your mouth counts. Now, it counts less than you think it does, because, quite frankly, not a lot of people tune in to see back and watch the day-by-day -day, uh, occurrences at Queen's Park, or on the Hill, for that matter. Um, but uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to stand up and, and speak, especially when you're being heckled at every second word you say. So, um, so there's that. And also, of course, um, if you don't have a whole ministry behind you, as those in opposition do not, uh, you're doing a lot of research, you're doing it with your staff, but you're asked to speak uh, really, uh, you know, without a lot of background and work um, on the, uh, on, you know, on the spur of the moment sometimes in a way that not most people are in their jobs. So there's a lot that makes it a pretty, you know, nail-biting experience. And then, of course, is the pressure from your own party. So so, I mean, put all of that together, and um, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I'm going to pick up on the pressure from your own party in just a second. I will come back to that. But I think it's fair to say that the NDP presents itself as a party that is um, 
that is less encumbered by things like male domination or has less anti-LGBTQ uh, personnel inside it. And I want to know from your experience of having been in that party for so long whether you think that's actually true. I do think it's true, but I don't think it's without, uh, you know, a uh, bias. Uh, and I don't think it's without elements of a patriarchy in it. And I do document those in my book. Um, so, yes. Um, and this is something that, you know, every uh, queer uh, MPP and uh, MLA and every female MPP or MLA uh, or MP, for that matter, uh, works for you know, against in their own party. And I simply tell the truth about it. I mean, uh, I've talked to others from other parties. We all wrestle with the same issues. Uh, and even in the NDP, which I think is still the Labour Party of Canada, which is, you know, why I still vote NDP. Um, uh, but we still have that issue and we have it in the Labour movement too. So I think to deny that we have it is uh, unreasonable and it's not truthful. So I, I chose to tell the truth about my experiences. Absolutely. Well well, truth-telling is not without consequence, and I want to take you back to the 2014 election. The NDP went into that provincial campaign with 21 seats, and they emerged from it with 21 seats, and were basically wiped out in the city of Toronto, which, of course, is your home turf. And you made some very blunt post-mortem comments, and, uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up, and here's one of them. Um, this was your experience after that election. One day, I was literally screamed at across a crowded cafeteria in the basement in the presence of all sorts of visitors, party folk of all stripes and employees. One of our bully boy members yelled accusations and invectives in a public space. Mostly, I just avoided my own party and surrounded myself with people who wouldn't be abusive and with my own brave staff. My new policy was to record all conversations with leadership and to take my EA, my executive assistant, with me, if at all possible. As a friend said, I'd have the basis for a lawsuit or charges, but only if it became physical. Uh, okay, now, and we remind everybody, this is treatment from your own party. These are your own folks, not from the people that you've been running against. Yep. In your judgment, do you think you deserve that kind of treatment? Absolutely not. Um, and uh, and all I did, uh, it was to tell the truth, as I'm doing now with you, Steve. And I told the truth uh, to the press and also listened to the rank and file of my own party and told their truth and listened to the truth of the electorate who elected me and told their truth, too, which is what I think we're all elected to do. So, uh, again, I'm not alone in having this experience. Um, I may be a little unique in telling it in a book, but um, certainly uh, this is the experience that I've heard from other uh, people in elected office in all parties, so the NDP is not unique in that. But what I did was I told the truth about a, a terrible election campaign, um, an election campaign where we ran to the center, and of course, uh, as liberals tend to do, they ran to the left of us, got elected, and then, you know, governed from the right of uh, to the right of us. Um, but I told the truth about that. And I said that the only reason I won that election, remember, there were only two of us that did in either federally or provincially after that date, uh, it was Peter Tabins and myself. And in the I 416. Yeah, I only won by 500 votes, and every single one of those votes I worked for, I can tell you. And the way I won those 500 votes was telling people at the door that I would take their concerns about our party and about the campaign we ran uh, to the press and to the party, uh, and I did. And so I have no regrets about it whatsoever. Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, the simple reality that, again, if, uh, if, if folk told the truth about the, the experience in their own uh, cabinets and caucuses, they would tell you. Um, yeah. I told the truth uh, in public, which normally is only supposed to be told around a caucus table. Well, that's it. And let me play devil's advocate in here and say, I mean, it's not called the Sherry DeNovo Party. It's called the New Democratic Party. And there's an expectation that people like you will, um, you know, hold your truth a little closer to your vest and be good team players. Why did you find that you couldn't do that? Um, I found that I couldn't do that because, number one, it wasn't the truth. And I think that, they, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here with a collar on for a reason. 
I don't think I owe um, my my true allegiance to any party. Um, I owe I will stand before the God of my life, as we all will, and I hope we all do, uh, and uh, and tell the truth that I think you know people need to hear. Uh, and it was the truth, quite frankly, of the majority of the people rank and file that I heard in the party that weren't being listened to, and also those people in the public that weren't being listened to, and the people on the margins that weren't being listened to. And I think their voices are important. And it was also the truth of my experience. And I'm not going to say the emperor's got clothes on when the emperor does not. Um, and uh, I, I think if we all did this in elected office, people would have a little bit higher esteem for politicians. I don't think people like you know, so-called party hacks. I think they like people who tell, you know, the truth as they see it and as they are told to tell it. And again, I was elected um, by those people who voted for me um, only if I told the truth. So I, I, I run for them. And by the way, they're the only people that can fire you. My advice to people who are elected in elected office is that, you know what, um, your party uh, leadership cannot fire you. The only people who can are the people who elected you. Now they can kick you out. You can sit as an independent. All sorts of things uh, can happen to make your life less than, uh, you know, hunky-dory in your job. But at the end of the day, who do you represent there? You represent the people who sent you. Listen to them. And of course, listen to the margins, the people who really need you to be there. Um, and I don't regret telling the truth on behalf of those folk ever. Well, let's do a little more truth telling here. There's going to be an election in June 2022. Can Andrea Horvath win that election? I hope so. I mean, again, I think the NDP is the best bet we have in terms of taking down what has been a very, very dangerous government. We are, of course, uh, talking in the midst of a uh, third wave of a pandemic. So what do we need? Yes, we need an alternative. Um, and I hope, of course, um, that that alternative comes to pass. I also hope uh, that uh, those folk who are sitting around the caucus table feel that they have the ability to tell the truth about what they're experiencing. And I hope that they always feel that they've got, you know, again, uh, the ability to stand on principles, even if that means speaking out against leadership. And this goes for all parties, not just the NDP. Uh, but certainly, absolutely, we need a change from our current Ontario government. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sherry, in our remaining moments here, I want to ask you about something that we now have in the province of Ontario called Toby's Law. What is that? Uh, Toby's Law was the very first LGBTQ uh, piece of legislation that I fought for and finally won, and that added trans rights to the Ontario Human Rights Code. And we were the first jurisdiction in North America to make that happen of any size at all in Ontario, and that was a dramatic success. And it, it took me a long time to get it. Um, I tabled it again and again and again uh, until finally we got it done. Uh, uh, and I want to thank the members of two, the other two parties who signed on to that bill for me. Um, it was one of many. I mean, banning conversion therapy also got that passed, um, also got Trans Day of Remembrance passed, got parent equality done. So um, there were a number of LGBTQ uh, bills, in fact, more than anybody in of any legislature in Canadians' history. Um, and a lot of that was by working with others around Queen's Park. So again, another piece of advice, uh, do that, because at the end of the day, what people need who need you to be effective in your role as an elected representative is to get things done, to get something accomplished. And let's finish up on this. How is it that you, a one-time atheist, ended up with that collar on? Uh, well, first of all, and, and Steve, you touched on this earlier, being a child of trauma, um, uh, understanding that uh, I'd had a difficult life. Uh, at the time that I walked into church for the first time, it was when I was doing really well. I actually had my own business. I was making more money than I've ever made since. Uh, and I realized at that point that my moods were dependent on my company's billings, and that was not a way to live. Uh, and certainly, I, I understood that the recession of the early 90s gave me an opportunity to maybe, you know, divest 
from my business and go back to school. And I really wanted to study uh, uh, something that wasn't, you know, about politics, quite frankly, that wasn't uh, uh, wasn't geared to making money, um, that was actually focused on, on God. And what do I mean by God? The source of all love. Um, in the Bible, it says God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God lives in them. I wanted to really research what that was about and to go back to seminary. I didn't at that time know that I'd end up wanting to be ordained, but certainly with Don's death and other occurrences in my life, the path became very clear to do just that, and I've never regretted it. It's the best job in the world. Hmm. Well, it's an incredible story, incredibly well told, so congratulations on getting The Queer Evangelist, A Socialist Clergy's Radically Honest Tale, written and out there for others. Thanks, Sherry DeNovo, for coming on to TVO tonight. And thank you, Steve, for having me. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, May the 18th, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll consider the devastating toll of COVID-19 in India. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pagan's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org daily.